Welcome back, everybody, um, to the second lecture of, two six, or of 162. Boy, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, so what I would like to do today is uh, dive right into the material. And um, let's try to keep comments during the actual lecture in the chat as actual questions. And uh, let's see what we can do. So uh, as you remember from last time, uh, we were talking about what an operating system is. And, um, you know, I think, I hope I kind of mentioned by the end of the lecture that it's really hard to say exactly what it is because not everybody agrees. So we could kind of ask what it does. And that's what we did here. We talked about how an operating system acts as a ref referee, illusionist, and glue, where the referee is managing protections on resources. We'll talk a lot about that as the term goes on. Illusionist is the, uh, the notion that we're gonna somehow make it look like we have a really clean set of resources that are much better than the actual ones are. And uh, virtual machine technologies help in this in some sense. And then the glue is kind of a set of common services that basically make writing programs on top of an operating system much easier. And things that you're very familiar with are things like windowing systems and file systems. So if you also uh, recall, we started talking about, for instance, what an, the OS might do for protection. And what you see here is an example of two processes. We're gonna say more about them as we go on today, uh, that each think they have a machine that has all of the system resources to themselves and has a set of virtual resources like threads, address spaces, files, and sockets uh, that they can utilize any way they want. And we can have more than one of these running at the same time on top of the same physical hardware. And that's the job of the operating system. And one of the things that we did talk about, uh, which we're gonna bring up again today, is this notion that uh, program two, which is in green here, is not allowed to talk uh, or otherwise observe, modify process one's state, not allowed to modify the operating system in ways that aren't allowed, not allowed to modify storage unless they're allowed. So, this is part of the uh, referee aspect of operating systems. And we kind of said if process two tries to do any of these things, then typically uh, the operating system will object and you might get a segmentation fault uh, with core dump or something like that where the, the process is essentially killed off. So um, the other thing that uh, we started to talk about is that the, the world of hardware is very complex and it's for very many good reasons. And that world of complexity needs to be managed in a way so that we can still write programs that function properly, okay? And the, um, a good question that's in the chat right now was back on this previous slide of would a second instance of the same program get, its, uh, get a separate process? And the answer is yes. So if you recall a process was an instantiation of a program and you can have multiple instantiations of the same program. So um, among the examples of complexity, I just wanted to show you here, we kind of talked about the Skylake uh, processor series uh, last time briefly. And you can see that there's um, the core uh, chip itself is um, directly connected to really high bandwidth DRAM channels and uh, high speed graphics and so on. And then there is this uh, interface, the direct media interface to what's often um, it used to be called the South Bridge, but it's basically the, the uh, chip that connects to all the rest of the I.O. And off of that, we can have things like high-speed I.O. devices for PCI Express. We can have disks. We can have slow I.O. through USB. We can have Ethernet, uh, HD audio, PCIe drives, RAID, Smart Connect, whatever. And then there's an even slow interface off of that that gives us BIOS and all sorts of interesting things. So really... The reason that operating systems are so crucial is they provide a way to take this complexity and manage it, okay? Now a slide I didn't really get a lot of time to talk about last time was this one, which you can go to uh, uh, this uh, link that I've got down the bottom here, information is beautiful.net slash visualizations, million lines of code. And it kind of talks about millions of lines of code for different things that you're familiar with. And uh, if you look, for instance, one of the things that's a uh, constant of the universe is, for instance, that going to a later version of something typically increases the size of that thing and the complexity of that thing tremendously. So, for instance, from uh, Linux 2.2 to Linux 3.1, if you notice, that's, a, that's an increase of maybe a factor of six or more. And 
The other thing to look at is things like cars, which we take for granted, are getting very complicated in terms of millions of lines of code. So this is almost 100 million lines of code in a modern car that, uh, boy, when you're traveling at highway speeds, you want to make sure there aren't any bugs in that. Okay, So we have a lot of complexity to uh, deal with. And of course, uh, yeah, I have no idea how many lines of code in a 747. That's a really good question. I would say a lot, uh, especially um, especially the modern systems, which are essentially flown by computer pretty much. Um, if you think about ways in which the complexity leaks into the operating system, uh, what you see, for instance, is that third party device drivers, which are uh, written by companies other than the OS provider are often places where bugs happen and are the reason for a high fraction of crashes, okay? And um, you know, you buy a device, it gives you a third party device driver, which you then install. That device driver wasn't necessarily uh, you know, written all that carefully, although Microsoft over the years has come up with vetting processes to try to make things better, so as Apple, so as the Linux uh, folks. But you could think of a device driver as a reason to provide a nice clean interface. And ironically, that uh, device driver interface is one of the things that causes things to crash. Uh, holes in security models. We'll talk a little bit uh, later in the term about, for instance, Vector and Meltdown. These are the two symbols for it. But uh, all of a sudden, in late 2017, early 2018, everything people thought they knew about securing data in a kernel turned out to be wrong because of uh, the way that people were designing processors to uh, do speculative execution. And um, basically, you could extract data directly from kernel space in many instances, uh, which is an issue. Um, the version skew on libraries can cause problems. And that's one of the reasons that Docker is so helpful. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. And then, of course, there's the uh, invariable data breaches, attacks, timing channels, uh, et cetera. Okay. And, you know, the question in the, uh, one of the questions in the chat here is sort of why are device drive, drivers particularly vulnerable? And it's really that uh, they are the, the part of the system that touches the uh, most complicated hardware. And uh, basically, they're trying to put a clean interface up to the software, but what's inside of them is potentially very complicated. Okay, and there's a lot of interesting uh, things that you can get just by Googling, for instance, and I encourage you all to do that. We'll talk more about device drivers when we get later in the term. Um, so the operating system is really trying to uh, help uh, abstract the underlying hardware and tame complexity. All right, and so you could think of there's hardware uh, underneath. The operating system is in between uh, to provide a clean abstraction, which we'll even call a virtual machine abstraction, to the operating system, okay? Now the question about how do we quantify uh, reliability and so on, there've been a number of attempts at that. It's been hard, um, but uh, if you actually look at people that have measured the root causes of a lot of crashes, um, something upwards of 50 or 60% of them at one point in time were actually attributable to bugs in, in uh, device drivers, which is uh, pretty spectacular. Um, so the way we uh, deal with this abstraction uh, mechanism here, or this virtualization mechanism, is again, we're providing uh, various resources that are better than the hardware version. So instead of processors, we're going to provide threads. We'll talk about that today for the first time. Instead of memory, uh, which is a bunch of DRAM pieces, we're going to provide address spaces. Instead of disks or SSDs, which have blocks, we're going to produce a file system. Uh, instead of networks, we're going to have a nice clean socket interface. Instead of machines, uh, we're going to have processes, all right? And this is going to be a, an ongoing discussion throughout the next several weeks where we talk about how to, the operating system virtualizes the hardware pieces to give you a much cleaner environment. The BIOS uh, was asked about in the chat is typically a way of providing a set of standardized services on top of hardware. And um, part of the BIOS is a legacy to old days in uh, IBM PCs. But some of it also provides firmware that can get updated and help the hardware be a little bit more reliable, thereby making the operating system's job better. 
Okay. And yes, device drivers run in supervisor mode, which is one of the reasons, except for microkernels, which we'll talk about later in the term as well. So the operating system as an illusionist is really part of our topic today. We're going to talk about the four uh, interesting uh, functions of the operating system that really are leading to this illusionist idea. And we're mostly going to work on the thread and process uh, concepts today. Okay. And um, Basically, as an illusionist, the uh, OS is going to try to remove hardware software quirks as a way of fighting complexity and optimize for convenience, utilization, and reliability to help the programmer. All right. And for any OS area, you pick it, um, file systems, virtual memory, networking, scheduling, et cetera. You can ask the questions of what hardware interface do you have to handle and what software interface are you going to provide. And um, oftentimes, the hardware interface uh, talks about a set of mechanisms that the operating system exploits to provide a set of uh, clean mechanisms and policies up to software. And we'll use that terminology as we go throughout the term. Okay. And um, yes, it is true that complexity is a very hard thing to measure and to uh, talk about in a quantitative sense, but certainly you know what it means in a qualitative sense. And it's that qualitative sense that tends to get in the way of people uh, knowing that their systems are going to function properly. Now, so today we're going to basically talk about four fundamental OS concepts. We're going to start with talking about what a thread is. Um, and a thread is going to fully describe a uh, program state or a, a linear execution context. It's going to have a program counter, registers, ex execution flags, a stack, etc. This is going to be uh, very familiar, hopefully, to all of you uh, based on 61C. And then we're going to now then move off into address spaces, either with or without translation, which are a set of memory addresses accessible to the program. And we're going to talk about how, with the right mechanism, we can uh, provide a much cleaner behavior than the underlying hardware. And then we're going to introduce what processes are. And uh, finally, we're going to talk about a particularly important hardware mechanism for the early parts of this class, which is dual mode operation which is the fact that a typical uh, processor has at least two different modes, which we may loosely call kernel mode and user mode, and we exploit that to give us our better virtual machine behavior. Okay. Yes, so um, moving forward now, so what's the bottom line? We're going to run programs. And that, uh, we're going to learn how to write them and compile them, so you guys get to do that uh, right away with, uh, with uh, homework zero and um, Project Zero, starting tomorrow. And then once they've been uh, written, then we're going to talk about how things get loaded into memory, OK? After their executables pulled off the file system, it's loaded into memory. We're going to talk about the stack and the heap getting uh, put together for that particular process. And then we're going to transfer control, which is really means the program counter of the processor is going to be pointing at instructions in the user code of that process, and then the execution will start. Okay, and uh, and then of course the operating system is going to provide services like file system and so on to the program, and uh, and it needs to do all of these things while protecting the OS and the process from other processes. Okay, and other users. All right. So threads. Uh, can be thought of in the following way. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, threads and their heaps. But if you look, um, for instance, here back in 61C, you got to learn about processors. And the processor was something that started out with having a program counter, as you recall, and a memory that it could read. And in that memory was a set of instructions. Okay, And so that program counter would point into the memory and allow the processor to fetch the next instruction, if you all remember. So we'd pull the instruction in. From memory, we would decode it. And then we would feed it to the execution pipeline, which uh, the one that we often talk about in 61C is the five-stage execution pipeline for a RISC-style processor. And um, after things were decoded, they would uh, feed a set of registers and an ALU to do actual operations and uh, execute as desired. And at that point, you'd go on to the next uh, instruction and so on and increment the program counter. OK, and so um, this is hopefully familiar to everyone from 61C. 
Uh, and if it isn't, I would suggest that you guys go back and, and review a bit. But let's talk a little bit about our virtualized version of what we said there. So our first OS concept is going to be a thread of control. And a thread is really uh, a single unique execution context. And it's got a program counter, registers, execution flag, stack, memory state. Um, and so now all of a sudden you're going to say, well, wait a minute, isn't that just what you had on the previous slide? OK. And if you look, uh, Yes, what you learned about was a very simple uh, fetch execute cycle in 61C. Once we get to uh, something we want to provide to other people, uh, to users in particular, we need to virtualize it. And so the thread is going to be like a virtualized version of your 61C processor. Um, and a thread is executing on the processor or core. So by the way, I'm going to intertwine processor and core until we uh, can make that a little bit more clear later, but it's executing when it's resident, okay, in the processor registers. So we may have many threads, but on a given core, only one of them is resident and has control of the program counter and registers at any given time, okay? So what does resident mean? Let's just be very clear. So the registers have the, the context of the thread or the root state, it includes the program counter, um, currently executing instruction, the program counter is pointing at the next instruction in memory, and all the instructions are stored in memory. Um, the resident state includes intermediate values for ongoing computations. So typically, once you get into pipelining, which you started to learn about in 61C, um, there's a lot of pipeline state involved in an ongoing execution. Uh, if you're really interested in that, I would highly suggest something like 151 or 152, uh, where you learn uh, a lot more about interesting pipelines and speculative execution. We'll be talking a little bit about that throughout the term, but um, that's more of a hardware architecture class. But um, resident also means that there's a stack pointer that has a pointer into memory. It's just the top of the stack. And um, pretty much the rest of the thread is in memory. So there's some things in the registers that, and the rest is in memory, okay? And you'll see how that looks in a second. So a thread is suspended or no longer executing when its state's not loaded in registers, okay? So it's kind of the opposite of resident. And at that point, the processor state is pointed at some other thread. So the thread that's, that's suspended is actually sitting in memory and uh, not yet uh, executing or not executing at all while something else is executing. So uh, program counter is not pointing at the next execution from this thread because it's pointing at the execution of the current thread. Okay. Now, uh, here is another view of what happens during execution. This is another kind of 61C view. If you look here, here is uh, the set of addresses, which we're going to call an address space a little bit later in the, arc, uh, in the lecture, that um, from 0 to 2 to the 32nd minus 1, and what it has in it is uh, a set of instructions that are going to be executed. And what you see in pink here is your processor. OK. And um, let's hold off on questions about where the state's stored when the thread's not running. Um, the way a thread's different from a process, if you can give me a, a, a few more slides, we'll get to that as well. But it's basically the process has a protection state associated with it. So if you look at the set of registers and the pipeline, that's the processor, and this might be the currently running thread, which means our execution sequence fetches an instruction at the program counter, decodes it, executes it, writes it back to registers, grabs the next instruction, and repeats. So this is a wash and repeat kind of scenario. And so, for instance, the program counter might start at instruction zero and then goes to one and two and three and four as we're going. And this in essence, is what it means to execute, OK? This is the, the basic uh, von Neumann machine that we're all very familiar with uh, that you learn about in 61C and that we're going to take for granted because we're going to put an operating system on top of it. Uh, the one thing that's going to be a little different from uh, what you're used to is rather than risk 5 which is kind of what they do in 61C, we're going to use uh, a more common processor called an x86. Uh, which is the Intel processor, and probably all of you who have laptops these days all have x86s on them. Um, I understand that uh, it, Apple is basically punting the x86 in some of the upcoming generations, but uh, we're probably all using the same processor. 
And the set of registers are a little different from the RISC-V processors you're used to. So there's a smaller number of execution uh, registers, um, but there's also a lot of other things like segment registers and so on, which we'll talk about over time. Um, but if you notice on the left here, we have RISC-V, which had uh, say 32 registers associated with it. On the right, we have x86, which has a much smaller number of registers that you can actually execute on, um, and then uh, a bunch of other state. Now, the question about what an execution flag is uh, came up in the chat, and a lot of different processors have the following uh, associated with them. If you subtract two uh, registers to get a third, not only does it give you the result of that subtraction, but then a set of flags get set, like did when you subtracted those two registers, was the result zero? So that's like the zero flag, or was it greater than or less than zero? So there might be a greater than flag. So those flags are then subsequently things that you can actually make uh, branches, uh, branch decisions on. So you might branch of equal, and the way that's gonna work is with an execution flag. So um, take, take a look uh, in some of the supporting things that we have for you on the resources page. And uh, I believe in uh, section maybe on Friday, they'll talk a little bit more about the x86 as well. But uh, you're gonna get very familiar with x86, okay? So the question is, are execution flags like the control logic from 61C? And the answer is no. So think of uh, execution flags are like a bunch of little one-bit registers that hold some of the comparative results of what you just did. Okay, so they're, they're, uh, they're tiny result registers and you can save and restore them uh, during a context switch on certain processors. And if you look here, see the E flags. So those, for instance, are some of the flag registers that represent the results uh, of execution. So how do we get the illusion of multiple processors? We talked last time about, you know, doing a, a PSAUX or some other uh, task manager on your laptop. And uh, if you look, you'll find that there are hundreds of processes that are just running, uh, mostly sleeping, but they're all available on your current uh, processor. And so um, how does that work? So for the next, uh, I will say, couple of weeks, let's mostly assume that a physical processor has only one core on it or one thread of execution in the hardware at any given time. And we will, we will um, graduate to multi-core processors a little bit later. But for now, what we've got here is we want to have multiple CPUs or the illusion of multiple CPUs running at the same time so we can have multiple threads running at the same time. We're gonna have them all share the same memory so that the programmer's view is, well, I just have a bunch of things running and they all share memory, okay? Um, and the, the uh, question is kind of how do we get the illusion here? And this is not complicated. It's kind of what you would think. We're gonna multiplex that hardware in time, okay? So threads are virtual cores. And uh, what I show you here is assuming again for a moment that we have only one processor or one core in the system, then the way we get the illusion of magenta, cyan, yellow, running at the same time is we just multiplex. We run from cyan's thread for a little while and then uh, or from uh, magenta's thread for a little while, then cyan's, then yellow and so on. And we repeat. And so over time, we get this multiplexing of the same physical hardware. Okay. And um, the contents of a virtual core or thread is what? Well, clearly each one of these virtual CPUs needs to have a program counter and a stack pointer and uh, all of the register state that uh, we're used to if we were running that thread on a single processor in 61C, okay? So there's registers. Um, you might ask, where is it, the thread itself? Well, uh, if it's currently executing, so for instance, if we're in a period of time where uh, Magenta is running, then it's in the processor itself. And when it's not running, it's saved in memory that state is called uh, thread control block or TCB, okay? Um, now, 
let's continue on this illusion for a moment here. So consider this multiplex view in time. So at T1, uh, vCPU1 is running. At T2, uh, CPU, uh, the blue one, is running. So what happened between 1 and 2? Anybody want to hazard a guess? So, good. So what happens is a context switch is the high level answer. Um, the low level answer would be some event, okay? So the OS got to run somehow between uh, pink and blue, all right? And what happened during that context switch is we saved all of Magenta's uh, PC stack pointers, all the other registers in their thread control block in memory. We loaded the PC stack pointer, et cetera, from vCPU2, and we returned to run the, the uh, Cyan one, OK? So um, interesting questions here that are coming up. So first of all, one question was, does each uh, thread here get its own cache? And the answer is no, OK? So typically, in general, it's no. Typically. Uh, there's one cache per core, and so uh, they're all kind of sharing the same cache. So as you could imagine, if you switch too quickly, then nobody gets advantage of the cache, okay? And um, yes, the cache or the TLB uh, in a primitive processor has to be flushed when you switch. Uh, more advanced ones, it doesn't. We'll talk more about that as it goes on. Uh, the cache itself is typically in physical space, and you're switching from one thread to another. Uh, you just change page tables, and so you don't actually have to flush the cache. And we'll get we'll get into that. You guys are way ahead of me on this. Um, another question is, how long does this take? Well, this can take uh, something of the order of a few microseconds, and um, you want to make sure that the time to switch isn't uh, so long that you're spending most of your time switching. Okay, that would be a thrashing scenario that could be pretty bad. Okay. Um, so the other question, which is great, you guys are on top of things, wouldn't it be better to say run the magenta one to completion and then pick up the blue one? So uh, that would be a yes on efficiency, but not so great on responsiveness, okay? Because the, the poor task that's trying to run uh, in that cyan or blue uh, thread wouldn't get to run for a very long period of time, potentially. Okay. So we're going to talk about those issues when we get into scheduling. Okay. So you can already see how you're all asking the right questions. There's some very interesting ones here. Okay. But let's move a little forward here. Um, what triggered the switch? Well, we've already said things like a timer went off or a voluntary yield. We'll learn about that uh, very soon where uh, the Magenta one maybe decided to ask the operating system to do some I.O., at which point the OS said, oh, okay, let's, uh, let's schedule somebody else, okay. And uh, the question about how many registers there are is gonna depend vastly on which processor you've got. So yes, there are 32 integer registers on a RISC-V, which you guys are used to, and yes, there are some floating point ones as well. Um, on an x86, there's a much smaller number of registers. Um, and so when you don't have registers in the processor, you got to keep things in memory. And so you spend a lot of time going back and forth. So good questions. So um, now that we've started talking about how to get the illusion of multiple things, we can start looking at uh, what this model gives us. And the model gives us the following. We may have a bunch of memory that's in blue here, and we could think of each one of these virtual processes, you know, green, yellow, orange, has their own stack and heap and data and code, and they're all laid out in memory somehow, and what we need to do is somehow keep track of where everything is, okay? So the thread control block is that where everything is. So when we switch from green to yellow, the first thing we're gonna do is save out all of green's registers into its thread control block, which is, by the way, in part of the kernel memory, which I'm not showing here, okay? Um, the question about in-flight instructions that's in the chat's an interesting one. So typically what happens 
when you get an interrupt is you end up flushing the pipeline. So mostly in-flight state is all squashed when you switch. Okay. We'll talk more about that a little later too. Where are the TCBs stored? They're stored in memory. Um, for now, we're going to say they're stored in the kernel. I want to say for now because we're going to talk about user level threads and some pretty interesting things in a couple of weeks. Excuse me, but for now, let's assume they're in the kernel. And if you're, you know, you start working on Pintos, which by the way you are, we're going to release uh, Project Zero tomorrow. Uh, you should take a look at thread.h and thread.c right away. You'll start to see how it is that Pintos, which is the operating system we're using for the projects, implements threads. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some administrivia. You should be working on homework zero. Okay. It's due Thursday already. Okay. Uh, and you know the um, the reason for homework zero is really to make sure that you have uh, experimented with everything and you're ready to go. So you get to experiment with GDB, you get to experiment with compiling, you get to work on your tools, okay? You get to learn about Git if you're not sure about it. You get your virtual machines up and running, okay? And so um, we're gonna have project zero uh, up tomorrow. I know originally it wasn't up until Thursday, but we're pushing that a little forward. Project zero is a chance for you to really get going on the Pintoff's projects and it's intended to be done on your own. So do not do this with uh, potential partners, do this on your own. Um, and it's really about everybody who's gonna participate in a group, learning some basic things about how to uh, run the projects, okay? And so again, I suggest you get moving on that right away as well. Uh, I did wanna say something about slip days on projects and homeworks. Uh, this term, because of uh, the, um, you know, because of the virtual nature of this class and things are complicated and difficult to get moving, we're, uh, we're upping the number of slip days to four for both homeworks and projects. Uh, but when you run out of slip days and you don't get any uh, credit for things that you're slipping on. So I would suggest that you bank, okay? Uh, the Bank your slip days. Don't use them up right away uh, because you may want them later in the term. Tomorrow is uh, an optional review session for C, and uh, actually I think we're billing it as for a bit of C++ as well. Uh, there's a Zoom link that's gonna be announced. Um, it may be already up on Piazza. Uh, it will probably record it, um, but I would consider attending. Uh, and in that, we've got, people are gonna go over some of the basic things about C that you're gonna wanna know, okay? Uh, C++ is, not really required for this class uh, in answer to the question that's in the in the chat there you're really going to use c okay but uh doesn't hurt uh, to look at what we've got for c plus plus as well uh, um, as well not really required means that the uh the work you're doing in pintos is in c um and uh friday that is four days from now is drop date Okay, so it's an early drop date class and it's very hard to drop afterwards. So if you're not interested in the class, you should uh, drop sooner rather than later so that people can be pulled off the wait list. Okay, um, and the thing that you need to do is if you have friends who are either on the wait list or in class, but they haven't been doing any work, there are in danger of being put into the class uh, without them knowing okay and you may you may think that that's ridiculous but it happens every term somebody wasn't paying attention and they end up three quarters of the way through the term and discover that they're in the class and they can't drop okay it's very hard to drop late uh, without burning one of your, your you know your one and only late drop day so your late drop class so uh just try to make a decision on that. Okay. Any questions on that part? Okay. It is true that Berkeley does not uh, have a mainstream C++ class, 
uh, in the computer science department. Um, there's lots of great languages out there. Uh, and so uh, somebody who knows C uh, is at least, I would say, a third of the way to C++. Uh, but uh, you may end up learning C++ on the fly for other classes, like 184, for instance. OK. So just to remind you from last time, you know, this virtual class that we're in here is challenging and uh, for everybody, OK? And things are um, considerably different. Uh, starting off remote, not even starting off uh, physically. And so that means that we've got to figure out how to reestablish uh, the people interactions and collaborations that we would have if we were in person, okay? Um, how do you recover collaboration without direct interaction? That's gonna be challenging. And so I'm asking everybody here, I'm putting out a plea to do your best to talk to people more uh, than you would in a real term, okay? You gotta have more meetings, uh, drink coffee with your friends on Zoom more often or with your uh, group mates, okay? This is important. Um, and you got to figure out how to bring people along virtually, okay? It's very easy in this world where um, I heard Umesh Vazirani describe what we're doing right now as we flatten the world graph, okay? So everybody's equidistant from everybody else, and as a result, nobody's close to anybody, <laughs> okay? Yes, I've become a flat earther for, uh, with respect to this class. Um, Cameras, as I've mentioned before, are essential components of this class. So what we're trying to do is uh, make sure that people maintain their interactions, okay? And we're gonna need it for exams and discussion sessions, design reviews, et cetera, okay? And um, have a camera, plan to turn it on, and let's try to keep that human interaction going, okay? Um, the uh, we need to bring back personal interaction. Um, humans are not good at interacting via text only. You can kind of see what happens with uh, Twitter in the public life is, is uh, really not a great thing. And so let's do everything with uh, in person, as in person as we can get with a camera interaction, okay? And uh, you're gonna have required attendance at the discussion sessions, design reviews, et cetera, with the camera turned up. Okay, now. Uh, the other thing I wanted to remind you guys of is the collaboration policy, all right? You got to, um, you know, if you're explaining a concept to somebody, that's okay. If you're discussing algorithms or testing strategies with other groups, that can be okay. If you're discussing maybe debugging approaches with other groups, but kind of at an abstract level, that's okay. Um, if you're allowed, allowed to do searching, for generic algorithms like hash tables, et cetera. Okay, these are all okay. What you're not allowed to do is uh, share code or test cases with other groups, okay? And we track that, okay? We have uh, mechanisms that compare people's code with other people's code from earlier terms and in the class and so on. Um, just don't do it. Uh, copying or reading another group's code or test cases, just don't do it. Copying or reading online code or test cases from prior years or other members of your group, just don't do that, okay? Uh, helping somebody to debug in detail in another group, don't do that either, okay? Because what happens is um, if you know, you're helping somebody debug, you're now not only looking at their code, but you're importing your code kind of conceptually into their code. And we have had situations where debugging essentially caused the person that was being helped's code to, to uh, match against the other code and both groups got in trouble. So just, just say no, okay? Um, we're, uh, compare all project submissions against prior year submissions and online solutions. And so this is it, you know, just, just don't do it. And um, also don't put a friend in a bad position by asking for help that they shouldn't give you, okay? All right, good. Now, uh, are there any other administrivia questions? Nope. Okay. Um, 
now. Let me see. There was a question. Oh, there was a good question uh, in the in the chat from before I started the break, which was, you know, why not uh, just kill off one stage of the pipeline at a time? You know, it turns out. Oops, sorry. That um, it's very difficult to uh, restart pipelines uh, if you try to save some of the state and restart it. That's called precise exceptions. Uh, the question of precise exceptions, uh, if you can save part of the state and restore part of the state, that's an imprecise exception. Turns out that gets complicated very rapidly. It makes getting correct OS code really hard. So in general, they don't do that, okay? Um, and I will mention that a little bit later when we get into page fault, uh, hammer, uh, page fault as well, okay? Now, so uh, if people could turn off their cameras during class, that would be good, please. So uh, the second OS concept we're going to talk about today is address spaces, okay? And um, the simple idea is that uh, it's the set of accessible addresses and the state associated with them. So if you think back to 61C, you've got, uh, uh, let's say, a 32-bit address from zero up to FFFFFFFF, and this is the view that a processor has of memory. Now that's not to say that there's uh, DRAM in all of these spaces, it's just that this is the processor's view of what addresses are available. And so for a 32-bit processor, by the way, I'm gonna make you guys all know about powers of two, so if you don't know them yet, you should start learning them. Um, but two to the 32nd, for instance, is four billion approximately, okay, 10 to the ninth. Two to the 64 is 18 quadrillion, so that's a lot of addresses, okay. but. Um, if you think of the address space as all of the, the potential places that the processor could go, and then there are ones that actually are backed by DRAM, then there's some state associated with them. And the question might be, well, what can you do when you read or write to an address? Well, uh, perhaps it acts like regular memory, or perhaps it ignores the write entirely, or perhaps the system causes an IO operation to happen. That's called memory mapped IO. Or perhaps it causes an exception. It's possible if you try to read or write somewhere in the middle between the stack and the heap that I'm showing you here, and there's no memory assigned to that process, you get a page fault, okay? Um, or maybe the act of writing to memory communicates with another program, okay? So um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of possibilities here, okay? Now, uh, so my saying, quinti oh, I meant quintillion there, didn't I? Okay, thanks for the catch. Uh, so um, in a picture, I'll fix that slide, by the way. So in a picture, the address space is kind of like this, okay? So here is your 61C processor registers, okay? The program counter points to some address, and the stack pointer points to some address, typically the bottom of the stack. And um, other registers might point to things in the heap or uh, et cetera. And um, the fact that the PC can point to an address and it can fetch from that address means that we can have a processor that actually executes an instruction at that address. Okay, so whatever we come up with with our threading and protection model, it's going to involve accessing the address space. Okay, and so what's in the code segment, um, well, what's in the code segment's code. That's not too surprising. What about the static data segment? Anybody have any idea what would be in the static data segment? So many of you have started looking at GDB. Great, static variables, yep, global variables, et cetera, things that are um, explicitly declared rather than allocated with malloc, good. Yep, string constants, all of those things are typically in the static data, and that's loaded at the point when the program's first loaded while the process is being created. Um, what's in the stack segment? Anybody remember what is on the stack? Yeah, local variables. Okay, we're going to go through this more, but you should look back at 61C and recall what the stack's about, right? So the stack is uh, when you do a recursive call to a function, the variables that were of the previous function are pushed on the stack and then the stack pointer moves down and then when you return, you uh, pop them off the stack and the stack pointer moves up. 
So I also see locals, that's correct. So local variables. Um, the, uh, how do we allocate it? Well, we'll talk more about that. One of the things that's gonna be a very cool thing the operating system can do once you've got virtual memory is you can start to stack off with just a couple of, of pages. And then as uh, the stack tries to grow, it's gonna cause page faults and the operating system will then be able to add more physical memory to the stack. Okay, and the same is true of the heap. So the heap is when you uh, allocate things with malloc or so on, or you do linked lists, all of those things typically lay in the heap. And the heap is also starts out with less physical memory um, than maybe the program ultimately needs. And as the program starts to grow, you get page faults, which will allocate things on the heap, okay? So you don't have to worry about having caught all that now, but I'm just giving you some ideas, okay? Uh, what's in the heap segment? Well, I already said that. That's things that you have allocated with malloc. Think of uh, structures with pointers. Think of linked lists. Think of all sorts of things, okay? There's a rather amusing comment in the operating system that they are a really convoluted magic. Um, maybe, on the other hand, I'm hoping that by the end of the term, you'll see that they're just very clean magic, okay? All right, certainly uh, validating parts of the operating system can be easier to validate than a compiler. Now, so our previous discussion of threads is what I would call very simple multiprogramming. Okay, all of these vCPUs share the same non-CPU resources. The only thing we virtualize with our current threads are the registers, the program counter, the stack pointer, nothing else. So that means they all share all the rest of memory. They all share IO devices. They all share everything else, okay? And that could be an issue. Now, the question that's on the, the chat, which I find interesting uh, here right now is, can they uh, each assume they have infinite stack or heap? Uh, that's a really tricky question that we'll have to uh, defer a little bit more um, for, for a week or so. But the short answer is that uh, if they actually are threads and they're sa in the same uh, address space, then the threads can mess each other up by overwriting each other's stacks. But that's actually uh, sort of a design feature, okay? If on the other hand, you don't want that to happen, you put these in separate processes. So hold on for the rest of the lecture on that part, okay? Now, the uh, OS's job is going to be making the virtualization be as true as possible, given the resources and whether it's uh, a process or not. So, um, so if each thread can read or write every other thread's memory, maybe their data, maybe their security keys and so on, could it overwrite the operating system? Well, so far I haven't given you anything that would prevent you from overwriting the operating system. And uh, back in the early days of personal computing, okay, we're talking about some of the original uh, IBM PCs, some of the original Macintoshes, which were these weird looking square boxes. Uh, the early days of Windows definitely um, all had this problem, okay? That uh, yes, we provided the ability to have illusions of multiple threads at the same time, but they were all in the same address space and they could overwrite each other, okay? So we wanna do better, okay? So is this an unusable environment? Well, depends on your definition of unusable. It's certainly not very secure, okay? And it's not even very secure against your own bugs. Okay, and we'll talk a lot about that. But you'd like a system that uh, when you put a buggy piece of software up and run it, it doesn't crash everything else. That would be kind of a minimum requirement, I would say. Okay, so this approach, as I said, was used in the very early days of computing. It's used on some embedded systems still. Uh, Mac OS, uh, you know, Windows 3.1, Windows ME, a lot of those different ones basically had this view. Okay. However, it's risky. Um, you know, one of my favorite things to do, you'll find out my favorite number is pi, um, because why not? I mean, it's a great number, uh, but it goes on forever. But um, what's interesting is you can imagine that the magenta one decides to compute the last digit of pi, and it never gives up the CPU, locks out, the timer interrupts, and now uh, blue and yellow never run. 
Okay, that's a system we do not want to have, and that is a system we used to have. Okay, I worked on Windows 3.1 systems where you put the wrong uh, application in there, and all of a sudden, you know, everything locked up. So that's rather undesirable. So no protection. So the operating system has to protect itself from user programs. Um, and there are lots of reasons for this, right? From a reliability standpoint, uh, compromising the operating system generally causes it to crash. Of course it does. Security, you want to limit the scope of what malicious software can do. Privacy, I want to limit each thread to the data it's supposed to access. I don't want my cryptographic keys or my you know, uh, secrets to be leaked. Um, and also fairness. I don't want a thread like that one that decided to compute the last digit of pi to be suddenly uh, able to take all of the CPU at the expense of everybody else. Okay? So there's lots of reasons for pr protection. And the OS must protect user programs from one another, okay? Prevent threads owned by one user from impacting threads owned by another one. Um, all right, so let's see if we can do better. Okay, so what can the hardware do to help the OS protect itself from programs? Well, here's a very simple idea. In fact, very simple, that, so simple that little tiny IoT devices can do this with very few transistors. And the idea is what I'm gonna call base and bound. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have two registers, a base register and a bound register. And what those two registers talk about is what part of memory is the yellow thread allowed to access? Okay, what part of memory is the yellow thread allowed to access? Now, that, we're still gonna call this, by the way, I've got this, uh, sorry, zero at the top and, and FFFF at the bottom. I've uh, swapped this for you guys. But um, the, we are going to be able to put two addresses, one in base and a length or an address in bound, depending on how you do it. And now we're gonna see whether we can limit yellow's span to just the, uh, those range of addresses. Okay, and we're still gonna say the address space is from zero to all apps. It's just that a big chunk of that address space is not available to the yellow thing, okay? And so what happens here is a program address that fits somewhere in the, the valid part of the program what really happens is the program has been relocated. It's been loaded from disk and relocated to this portion of memory, one, zero, zero, zero. And so now when the program starts executing, it's working with program uh, counters that are in the, say, one, zero, one, zero range, which is kind of right uh, where the code is. And hardware is gonna do a quick comparison to say, is this program counter greater than base or is it, uh, and is it less than bound, okay? And these are not physical, uh, or excuse me, these are still physical addresses. These are not virtual addresses yet. We'll get to that in a moment, okay? And this allocation size is uh, challenging to change in this particular model, okay? Because in order to get something bigger, we might end up having to copy a lot of the yellow to some other part of memory that's bigger. So you can see that this is just a very primitive and simple thing, okay? But what it does do is it gives us protection. So the yellow code can run, it can do all it wants inside the yellow part of the address space, but it can't mess up the operating system or anybody, other, anybody else's code, okay? All right, and uh, whether base and bound are inclusive or not, that's sort of a simple matter of whether you include equals or not. So let's not worry about this. Obviously, base is inclusive in the way I've shown it here. Um, so the other thing is for every time we do a, uh, a lookup, we make sure that we're less than bound, so it's not inclusive on the top in this particular figure, and greater than or equal to base, and if that's true, we allow it to go through, and if it's not true, then we uh, do something like uh, kill the thread off or something, okay? Now, the address here has been translated. If you look, this is what it might look like on disk. It's got, you know, it's code starts at address zero. There's some static data after the code. Maybe there's a part of the heap or stack that's gonna be in there once it's loaded. But in some sense, it looks like everything started zero. And however, when we load it into memory, we relocate all the code so that it starts at address 1000 and is runnable from that point. And as a result, things uh, execute properly. So this is a compiler-based, loader-based relocation. Okay, but it allows the OS to protect and isolate. Okay.
okay? It needs a relocating loader. Now this, by the way, was what a lot of early systems did is they did relocation, okay, and had some base inbound possibilities uh, to work. So for instance, the early, uh, some of the early machines by Cray had this, this behavior. Okay, notice also that we're using the program counter directly out of the, the processor without train changing in any, so we're not changing any of the, the latency through transistors because we're not adding any uh, extra translation overhead as well. Okay, and the gray part up here might be the OS, yes. Now, if you remember in 61C, we talked about relocation. Um, so for instance, if you do a jump and link to the printf routine, um, what that translates into is a relocatable code where maybe the JAL opcode is uh, hard coded, but the printf uh, address is not until things get actually loaded and then this gets filled out. So this might be a relative address until the, the linker and loader pulls it into memory. Okay. All right. So we can do this with the loader. Okay. But a number of you have started to ask more and more about virtual memory. Well, here's another version of virtual memory that is actually, well, it's, uh, the previous one was a hardware feature because in hardware we're preventing uh, the program when it's running in user mode or as a user from accessing the OS. So that's a hardware-based check, okay? It's not software, all right? Now, the, uh, a slight variation on the base and bound is this one where we actually uh, put a hardware adder in here, okay? And this hardware adder, one way to think of this is that addresses are actually translated on the fly. So now, we take our yellow thing off disk and we load it into memory and it might still be at address 1000. But the difference is that the program is now, the program counter is now uh, executing as if it were operating in this uh, code that starts from zero. But in fact, what happens is by adding the base address to the program counter, we get a translated address that's now up in the space where yellow actually is. Okay. All right, so this particular uh, version of this is, uh, is very simple and it doesn't require page tables or complicated translation. Okay, so this is a hardware relocation. So on the fly, the program counter, which is operating as if we're in the yellow region, we add a base to it and it, the thing we actually use to look up in DRAM is the uh, new address, the physical address that we get from this virtual address added to the base pointer, okay? And can the program touch the OS? Once again, no, because if the program address goes negative, we can catch that. Uh, and so that would be below the base address. And if it goes too, too large above the bound, then we would also be outside of yellow. And so we basically protect uh, the system against the yellow, okay? And so um, once again, we're still doing checks here. Now, can it touch on the programs? No, because the bound catches it. So one way to get at this uh, is also with segments, okay? So in the x86 code uh, or x86 hardware, we have segments like the uh, code segment, the stack segment, et cetera, which are hardware registers that have the base and bound coded in that segment. So a code segment, is something which has a physical starting point and a length, and then the actual instruction pointer that's running is an offset inside of that segment. So the, the code segment is very much like this base and bound because we do this addition on the fly and checking for the, uh, the bound, okay? And the question about where does the base address, uh, how do we decide what the base address is? How do we decide what the bound is? Well, that's the OS. It's basically doing a best fit uh, of the current things it's trying to run into the existing memory. Okay. Now, a different idea which they did bring up in 61C, which everybody's clearly familiar with, is this idea of address-based translation. So notice that what we just did was a very primitive version of translation, where we took every address coming out of the processor and we added to it a base and we checked it against a bound, and that translation now is just add uh, a base and check a bound. But um, 
the thing we could do that's even more sophisticated is we could take every address that comes out of the processor and go through some arbitrarily complicated translator and have it look up things in memory. So uh, if you look at uh, how that might be, so let's think for a moment, what was the biggest issue with this? So there's several issues, not the least of which to grow the space for the yellow process or thread, I haven't told you how to distinguish those yet, we would have to um, copy the yellow thing somewhere else, okay? And, and what we're gonna do is then when yellow finishes and goes away, we've got a hole and we've got a fill. And so there's a serious fragmentation problem. So we'll talk more about that in an upcoming lecture, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna break the address space, which is all of the DRAM, into a bunch of equal size chunks all pages are the same size, so it's really easy to place each page in memory. And the hardware is going to translate using a page table. Okay, this is 61C. Okay, special hardware registers are going to store a pointer to the page table. And we're going to treat memory as a bunch of page size frames, and we can put any page into any frame, etc. We're going to talk a lot more about this, don't worry, uh, in upcoming lectures. And this is another 61C idea. Okay, but just roughly speaking, so just from a high level, don't worry about the details yet. But if we take something like a program counter or registers that are pointing at memory, we go through a page table to translate them, that's going to give us a part of memory. And now we can do interesting memory management. Okay, now by the way, I am the reason I'm covering all of these ideas is I'm giving you something to think about. Okay. And we're going to, in, in the upcoming lectures, we are going to fill in details on this, okay? But this is some part of the story, okay? So instructions operate on virtual addresses. Um, and these are, you know, instruction addresses, load store addresses, et cetera. They get translated to a physical address, and this is the DRAM. So the processor is looking in one address space, the DRAM in another, okay? And any page of the address space can be any page fry, size frame in memory, et cetera. This is going to be great once you get a better handle on this because it's going to not have the same fragmentation problem that the base inbound did that we talked about earlier. Okay. Now, the third OS concept that we want to talk about today is a process. And a process is really an execution environment with restricted rights. So if you remember, we talked about our simple virtual threads having this problem that everybody had access to everybody's memory. Well, we started to note how mechanisms for translation might protect us, okay? And so the idea of a protected chunk of memory that's uh, owned exclusively by an entity in an OS, that's called a process, okay? So the process has an execution uh, environment with restricted rights and one or more threads, okay? So it's a restricted uh, address space and one or more threads. It owns some file descriptors and file system context. We'll talk more the, about that as we go on. And it's going to encapsulate one more or more threads for sharing in a unique environment. Okay. And the good question uh, is how do we how do we protect this? There's a question on the chat which partially addresses this, which is of course if you have two processes and their translations point to different physical memory, then kind of by design they can't. Uh, get at each other's data because there's no way for a processor running process A to even address the data in process B, okay? And we're gonna, that's the advantage of translation. We'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, a lot more about that in upcoming lectures. So a process is an address space with one or more threads, okay? And the application program, when you start it up, typically executes as a process. So we'll talk about fork and exec and how do we create processes but the upshot is we create a, a restricted address space environment, and then we can run one or more threads in it, and now all of a sudden we've got a process, and that becomes our unit of protection uh, for the first couple of weeks of the class. Okay? And the page table is really gonna translate between virtual addresses and physical ones, um, and it can do both in a forward and a reverse fashion. So we're gonna talk about page tables in quite a bit of detail. So don't worry about the details yet. Um, they're, they're going to be coming. Just think of the high-level idea of translating for now. So why processes? Well, because we're protected from each other. 
and the OS is protected from them and processes provide that memory protection abstraction. Okay. And there's this fundamental trade-off between protection and efficiency. So if you have uh, a bunch of threads all in the same process, then yes, they can communicate really easily because they share the same memory. So they can communicate by one of them writes in memory, the other one reads from it. But they can overwrite each other. Okay, So there are times when you want to have uh, high performance parallelism where you want a bunch of threads in a process. But then when you want protection, you want to limit the communication between processes. So communication is intentionally harder between processes, and that's where we get our protection from. So here's a view um, of two different types of processes. Here's a single threaded one and a multi-threaded one. So uh, the only difference between these two is that the multi-threaded one has more than one thread running. If you notice this box that I show here for the single threaded process, for instance, is the protected address space. So everything that's going on inside here cannot be disturbed by something going inside in a different process. And in this example, since there's only one thread, we only have sort of one stack and one heap. Um, and uh, the code and data kind of live in there in this protected environment's great for the thread. Uh, nobody can disturb it. But if it needs to communicate, it needs to figure out how to communicate outside of its process. A multi-threaded process actually has a different stack for each thread because you need a stack to have a unique thread of uh, execution. It has a separate set of registers for the thread control block so that when we switch from thread to thread to thread to give that illusion of uh, multiprocessing, we need to switch out the registers from the first thread so that we can load them back from the second thread. Okay. So threads encapsulate concurrency. The address space is the protection environment. Um, you could kind of think of threads as the active part and the address space as the protected part. Uh, that may or may not help you. Um, but the address space, which uh, the protected address space is really going to keep buggy programs or malicious ones from impacting each other. Okay. And why do this multi-threads per process? Well, there are many reasons you might do this. One is parallelism. So if you actually have multiple cores, it's possible that, that by having many threads in the same process, you can have many things working on the same task at once. So you learned about parallelism in, in some of your early classes, like 61A. The other reason might be concurrency. So a good reason to have many threads in a process could be, well, most of them are sleeping, but thread A deals with mouse input, thread B deals with window movement, thread C deals with IO to disk or network or whatever. And so that concurrency is a situation where most of the threads are sleeping most of the time, but it's a much easier programming model to think of things as a thread that runs for a while, does some I.O. going to sleep, and then wakes up when the I.O. is done. And as you get more uh, familiar with threads and how they work, you'll be able to figure out kind of, you'll have a better idea why that's helpful. Um, so the question of is there a parallelism efficiency advantage you'd get from a process that you couldn't get from a thread. So keep in mind that a process has threads in it. So think of the process is the container and the threads are the execution element. Okay. And yes, these are a little bit like fibers, but a little more he heavyweight. Okay. So why do we need processes for reliability, security, privacy? Okay. Bugs can over only overwrite memory of a process that they're in. Uh, malicious or compromised processes can't uh, um, mess with other processes. Now, of course, if the operating system is compromised, every, all bets are off. But we'll even talk about later in the term, we'll talk about how to uh, set up situations where even if the operating system is a bit compromised, the, uh, the things that are running in it might uh, still be secure. Okay. Um, mechanisms to give us protection in isolation, well, we already talked about the fact that we need some hardware mechanisms for address translation. We showed you the very simplest, which was uh, an adder in the hardware. We, we hinted at something much more complicated, like page tables or whatever. Um, but also, we have to worry about, well, if we have page tables, why can't process A change its own page tables to point at process B? Because that would destroy all of the protection. Okay, and so that leads us to our fourth mechanism, which is we need the hardware to support some privilege levels of some sort. And so that's the idea of dual mode. Okay, so hardware provides at least two modes. Okay, 
And um, the two modes are kernel mode and user mode, okay, or supervisor mode. And uh, certain operations end up being prohibited when you're running in user mode. So when you're in user mode, you can't, for instance, change which page table you're using. That's something only the operating system in kernel mode can do. You can't disable interrupts, okay? So that way, a process that's decided it wants to compute the last digit of pi can't prevent other ones, other processes from getting CPU time when the timer goes off, okay? You're also prevented from interacting directly with hardware, et cetera, thereby not being able to breach files on disk. And now the question is, what's our carefully controlled transitions between user mode and kernel mode? Things like system calls, interrupts, exceptions, okay? And so you could think roughly speaking that we have user processes, they make a system call into the kernel, that's a transition from user mode to kernel mode that's very well controlled, we'll talk more about that. And then the kernel does a return back to user mode for the user to run, okay? And so this is a typical Unix system structure, monolithic Unix system structure where uh, kernel mode represents code that has secure access to all sorts of resources. The it controls the hardware directly. And then of course, user mode is something that, uh, it's all of your programs and your libraries and so on. And so user mode is your application, but then it uses services from kernel mode and that's the operating system kernel, okay? So for instance, Here's an example where we've got hardware, got kernel mode and user mode. The hardware might ex execute or exec a new process, okay? And then later we'll exit and return to kernel mode, okay? Um, a system call from user mode would go into kernel mode and then it might return later. Or an interrupt might cause user mode to go into the kernel, which then might check out the hardware somehow and then eventually do a return from interrupt. An exception, which is something like you divided by zero, or a page fault's an exception, might go into the kernel and then eventually return. Okay. Now there's additional layers of protection than just the two I talked about here. And we'll, when we get into talking about virtual machines and actually containers um, like Docker and so on, we'll talk about how to put more layers than just the two. But for now, we're dealing with uh, dual mode. Okay. Now, tying it all together, uh, we can tie it all together very simply, okay? Um, and give me, uh, so tying this all together uh, is the following. So if you notice, here I have two processes, a green and, and a yellow one, okay? And uh, yeah, that was like a page fault. And uh, if you look at uh, the OS, here is the gray code. And if you notice our system mode right now is kernel mode. So it's red and uh, it's on. And when we're in kernel mode with simple branch and bound, what you see here is that there may be base and bound registers, but they're being ignored because in system mode, we have access to the full address space, okay? And let's take a look. So the OS is gonna load a process, okay? And what that really means is it's gonna take this uh, a register, which we're gonna call the user PC, load it with a pointer to the code, uh, to the starting part of the yellow code. And if you notice, uh, there's gonna be a bound or a an, uh, potential uh, top of, of that uh, area. And what we're gonna do is we load the, the yellow off of disk, we set up these registers, okay? But notice, by the way, since the OS is running, uh, the PC is still pointing to gray, not to yellow, okay? But what we're gonna do is then we're gonna uh, execute a return from interrupt uh, or return to user, and that's gonna start us running the yellow code. Now the question is, why does stack grow up in these diagrams? That's because uh, I've got year, uh, zero and FFFF reversed. So the lower part of the, day of, uh, the address is up top here and the higher part is uh, on the bottom. Sorry about that. Um, but notice, right now, the, the kernel has full access to everything. If we um, now do a return to user, what's gonna happen is um, that we're gonna activate this yellow one, okay? So the privileged uh, instruction is to set up these special registers, like the base and bound registers are gonna get set up, 
and so on. So notice we've set base to the beginning, we've set bound to the end, we've set up uh, some special registers, we've set up the user PC, um, and we're gonna do the return to user mode and that's going to basically do two things. One, it's gonna take us out of system mode, which is gonna activate these base and bounds, and it's gonna cause the user's PC to be swapped in for the existing kernel PC, and now all of a sudden after I do that, voila, we're running in user mode, okay? Why do I say we're running in user mode? The answer is that um, right now, because we're in system mode, not, or we're not in system mode, we're in user mode, the base and bound are active, and so the code that's running can't get out of this little container, okay? All right, and um, coming back, so how does the kernel now switch? So now we've got this guy running, what do we do? Well, we're gonna have to take an interrupt of some sort and say switch to a different process, okay? So um, the first question we have to ask before we uh, figure out what the switching is involved is how do we return to the system, all right? And I showed you some opportunities there a little uh, um, a moment ago, but we have three. So for instance, system call uh, is one where the process requests a system service that actually takes it into the kernel, okay? Another is an interrupt. Okay, this is a case where an asynchronous event like a timer goes off and takes us into the kernel. And a third one is like a trap or an exception. Um, it turns out that these could be examples where uh, we get a page fault or where we divide by zero. Okay, now the interesting question that's on, uh, an interesting question in chat, which I don't have a lot of time to answer right now is, uh, was what if uh, a program can, needs to do something that can only be done in uh, kernel mode? The answer is you got to be really careful. So one answer would be you can't. You got to do only the things that are provided as APIs from the kernel. That's why the set of system calls is so important to make sure it's general enough for what you want to do. Uh, the second answer gets much more interesting, which is typically not something we talk about at this term uh, in 162, but we could maybe, and that's where uh, we have a, an interface for downloading specially checked code into the kernel to run in kernel mode uh, in a way that it doesn't uh, compromise the security. But uh, that's a pretty interesting topic for a, a different lecture. So we could, we could uh, invoke any of these things, system call interrupt or trap exception to get us into the kernel so that we can do a switch. So let's assume we do an interrupt, okay? And these are all unprogrammed control transfers. So how does this work? We're gonna talk a lot more about this in, the next, in another lecture, but the way this works to have uh, the interrupt interrupt into a well-defined part of the kernel is we're gonna actually have that interrupt, the timer interrupt, look up in a table that we have put in there when the, the OS boots and pick the interrupt handler and that interrupt handler is now gonna run and make a decision about whether it's time to switch from process A to process B. And this is, by the way, the topic of uh, lecture in a week or so. Okay, so we're getting close to that, those topics. So, um, so let's continue. Here's our example, the yellow code's running. And if you notice, um, the program counter again is in the yellow code and so on. And how do we return to the system? Maybe an interrupt or IO or other things. We'll say an interrupt for this. And what happens at that point is we have now back in the kernel. So notice that we're at system mode. We're running the PC as the interrupt vector of the timer. And we've got these registers from the yellow, which uh, have been saved as a result of going into the interrupt. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna save them off into the thread control block. We're gonna load from the thread control block for green. Okay, and then here's by the way, somewhere in the kernel is the yellow thread control block. And then voila, we return to user and now the green one's running. So really this idea of swapping between processes and using dual mode uh, execution is pretty much shown by this example I just showed you there, which is you run for a while at user mode, the timer goes off, you save out the registers, you load in other ones, you return to user again, and you just keep doing that back and forth, all right? And um, the question about how the kernel process knows if there's an interrupt, the answer is it doesn't. What happens is the interrupt goes into the kernel and saves all of the state in the yellow code in a way that when it's restored and starts executing again, it doesn't know, okay? All right, and a typical time period for how frequently the timer goes off uh, is typically like 10 or 100 microseconds between timer ticks, 
Okay. Now, we're, uh, we're now officially out of time, but I want to leave you with one more concept. What if we want to run many programs? So now we have this basic mechanism to switch between user processes in the kernel. Kernel can switch among the processes. We can protect them. But these are all kind of mechanisms without sort of policy, right? So what are some questions like how do we decide which one to run? How do we represent user processes in the operating system? How do we pack up the process and set it aside? How do we get a stack and heap, et cetera, et cetera? All of these are interesting things that we're going to cover. Um, and, you know, aren't we wasting a lot of memory? All of these things. Okay. And um, so there is a process control block. Just like the thread control block, don't worry, uh, we'll get to that. But that's where we save the process state. And inside of that will be the thread control blocks for all the threads that are there. And then the scheduler is this interesting thing, which some might argue this is the operating system, which is every timer tick, it says, it looks at all the ready processes, picks one, runs it. And then uh, the next timer tick, it runs the next one and so on. And part of that process is unload and reload, unload and reload with the, uh, some task called the scheduler selecting, which is the right one based on some policies. All right, so we are done for today. So in conclusion, there are uh, four fundamental OS concepts we talked about today. The execution context, which is a thread. Okay, this is what you learned about in 61C. You didn't call it a thread because it wasn't properly virtualized yet, but it's basically something with program counter registers, execution flags, stack. We talked about the address space is the visible part of the, uh, uh, to a processor, it's the visible part of the addresses. And once we start adding translation in, now we can make protected address spaces, which are protected against other uh, processes. We talked about the process being a protected address, address space with one or more threads. And we talked about how the dual mode uh, operation of the, the um, processor hardware is what allows us to multiplex processes together and give us a nice secure model. All right, so there we go. That is, uh, in a nutshell, a modern OS. So um, that'll be the end of this class. There'll be a final uh, in several months. And, uh, oh wait, I'm just kidding. I hope you guys have a great night and we will see you on Wednesday. Ciao. Thank you.